Well, hi folks, this is Darren with My RV Works. We do have quite a few furnace videos for you on our YouTube channel, and you can check that out on our furnace playlist. Just go to our playlist tab along the top and cruise on down until you see for our furnace playlist. We've got all kinds of them. Overwhelmingly, those are videos that I've recorded out in the field when I make the repairs. But we were talking um, about doing a real quick video on some things that you could do before the season even starts, like a preventative maintenance type thing. So let's jump right in and talk about some of those things. What I'm going to want you to do before the season even starts, and this is also something that I do when I get called out on a furnace job, um, I want to do my sniff test and my um, hearing test, okay? We're going, to do, we're going to do a hearing test and a sniff test. We're going to check our nose and our ears. So um, what I want you to do, you can do it by yourself, but if you have two people, it's great. I want one of you with the better ears and the better sniffer to go outside and stand. Do I have an exhaust port handy? I don't within reach. Uh, well, there's one right here on this furnace right here. I want you to put your nose right here at this exhaust port. I want you to listen. So I want you to turn that furnace on. Here's what you should expect. You should expect that fan to start right away. Um, and then after about 18 seconds, thereabouts, 15 to 20 seconds, that's why I say 18, you should hear a click and you should have ignition. Okay, so that's a perfect test. If you do not hear a click, if you do not have ignition, you've got a problem. We have playlist topics for that. But let's do that before the season starts. Do you hear the click? Do you have ignition? And are you good to go? On those furnaces, the first thing it's going to do is evaluate the state of the sail switch. You give that furnace a call for heat. The first thing it's going to do is that circuit is going to go into its control board. It's going to go into the control board like this, and it's going to say, is my sail switch open at this point? And if your sail switch is open at that point, it's going to basically energize the fan, and the fan's going to start running. And after right away, it should detect that the sail switch has closed. It starts off with it open. It's going to start the fan the sale switch will close. So these are the things you're listening for. Now it's going to do a pre-purge for 15 to 20 seconds. I say 18 seconds. And then you're going to hear a click, which is going to be this igniter on your control board, this round thing. Don't touch it, it'll shock you. <laughs> uh, and it's going to start igniting an arc. You're going to hear another click, which is a gas solenoid opening inside the furnace. Again, our furnace playlist, we go through all of that. So these are just some real quick things that I want you to check on. Um, then you should have ignition. If you don't, then let's go a little bit deeper, check out our furnace playlist and see if you can find the problem you're having on our playlist, okay? If not, we do live streams on the first Friday of every month and you can ask us questions on there. So the second half of this video, it's just gonna be one video, but once I'm done with this part, we're gonna jump right into some questions that people had. During the season, I want you to identify and locate where your furnace is. Now you might need to take a couple screws out and gain access to behind a panel. It's gonna be like a louvered panel because air needs to get back into the furnace so it can heat itself back up and come back into your RV. Um, but I need you to put your eyeballs on that furnace. Now we're going to put a picture that I took of a furnace that was totally covered with, uh, I don't know what it was, just years and years of lint and dander and pet hair and everything, starving that furnace from any kind of air return coming to it. So I need to get your eyeballs on that furnace from the inside of your coach, and I want you to look at it. And what you're going to be looking at is, um, let's see here, on this furnace... These are the Atwood types. They're going to have a black cover right here. And that's where the air gets drawn back into the blower motor and blows across the heat exchanger. I want you to put your eyeball on that to make sure that that is not restricted at all. And well, what about putting a micron filter to get the allergies out wrong? Um, the manufacturers of the furnaces are going to say, please don't do that. It's not designed for that. That's, you can't put any restriction on these furnaces. They're designed to take the air out of your RV, run it through the blower motor, across the heat exchanger and back into your RV. No filters, nothing between that air coming into the furnace and going back into your coach. That also is to say, uh, I've seen several people, they'll put little screens or something over their floor registers. If you've got the registers in your floor um, because they don't want things to fall inside of there, that's also a restriction and it's not allowed according to your manual for these furnaces. Okay, no air restrictions on these furnaces coming in or going out. So make sure there's no restrictions. Some of the restrictions, like I said, on that picture we just threw up there, you, I will show you a picture of a furnace that's just totally covered over with lint and dander and pet hair and human hair and all kinds of other stuff starving your furnace. Okay, so if that's the case, in the middle of the season, before the season, just get a shop vac or something and vacuum it all up and that'll help you get your, your flow through it. Even still, if you're still having issues, you may need to gain access to your blower wheel because that blower wheel may also be restricted with a lot of hair on it as well. Okay, a lot of times those problems coincide with a faulted sail switch. Okay, so before the season, 
just turn it on and do some listening tests. If there's a problem and it doesn't work the way you expect, check out our playlist. We've got a lot of repair videos there. Mid-season, just do a mid-season check to make sure that there's no blockage or restrictions on any of the return air coming into your coach, in, into your furnace, okay? After the season, okay, now we're going to spring. We're having a wonderful time. The, the days are getting longer. It's warming up, maybe a little bit of rain and wind as that heat transition, cold transitions to heat. We love the springtime. Flowers are blooming and we're done with our furnace. Well, when we're done with our furnace, any problems that you had with it, keep like a log of all the things that happened to it. Now's the time to get in there, maybe pull the furnace out. You might have some time to actually make that repair, uh, upgrade some things on it, um, take a can of that office error and blow off your parts inside. Why? To get it ready for next season. And when next season gets here, guess what? At the beginning of the season, run through that pre-purge test, let it try to ignite and everything like that. And then, and then mid-season, clean out your return air, make sure that you're... Um, uh, return air and supply air. Your supplier return air, there's, there's no restrictions in there. At the end of the season, you would have kept a furnace log of all the things that are wrong with it, and you're going to kind of get it ready. At that point, I even would recommend during the springtime, after the furnace has been running for that season, pull that furnace out physically. Pull the furnace out of your RV like this and look at those heat exchangers. Let's see if one of these is the one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to get it. I've shown this furnace in a couple of my other videos, but if you look, let's see, right in here, right in there, you'll see a crack. It's not gonna focus on me and I don't have a hand to do it, but there's a crack in this heat exchanger. And um, how do we find that? Because at the end of the season, we did a service on this thing and we found the crack. So another thing you need to do, I put it on my bench so I wouldn't forget and I forgot. <laughs> Every year, let's check the propane pressure because these furnaces do consume propane. Let's make sure that the pressure feeding our furnaces is correct. If you look on the nameplate here, uh, I got this one here. I don't know if it's gonna focus on you guys, but that's the nameplate. Uh, there's a glare. Um, anyway, on that nameplate, you look on it, it's going to say Manifold pressure, 10 inches of 10 inches WC. WC is water column. It wants 10 inches of water pressure, uh, which is a, a value of pressure. It's about six ounces of pressure, okay? So once you get into those little numbers, they don't use ounces of pressure. They'll use inches of water column instead. But we need to make sure that it's right. If your pressure is too great, or if it's not great enough, then you're gonna have problems with your furnace. So at the beginning of the season, it's also good to have your propane pressure tested. That's something you should do every year anyway. So every year you're gonna back flush your water heater. Every year you're gonna check the pressure on your, on your LP regulator. Every year you're gonna pull your furnace out, look at your heat exchanger for cracks like this one does. You're gonna spin your little wheel with your finger. You're gonna do all those things and keep your RV happy and healthy. So that's all I wanted to cover on this now. During our live stream, we had some questions that we just weren't able to get to. So we're going to answer those questions right now. Okay, well, it's good to be back from out of the cold and dark, scary furnace realm. And um, so I've got Trisha with me. Um, she runs our office. And we did our live stream last time, and there was a few questions we weren't able to get to. And uh, so Trisha's got those questions ready for us. And so I'm going to... I kind of know what they are. <laughs> I'm going to kind of pretend like, oh, I don't know what that question is. Yeah, and, and give we'll, a brilliant answer. Yeah, hmm, I don't know. I've never, wow. I've never heard of that problem. So, uh, so we're going to go through your questions and try to get these last couple questions answered that didn't make it to the live stream. So, Okay, so our first question comes from Emily. And um, she had some issues with her furnace. So I'm going to read it here. Okay. Um, so she has a Suburban SF35FQ. Um, a mouse got into the furnace and broke the plastic blower housing, but not the wheel. So she glued it back together. Okay. There were some issues. It seemed like the fuses were blowing, but that seems to have resolved. So she, okay. she it looks like her furnace hopefully will be okay. But she expects that before the end of the winter season, the mice are going to be back and she's going to have issues again. So our question is, um, do you have any tips for preventing rodent infestation? Um... Cats work really well. Okay. Okay. Um, I do get this question a lot um, as I'm out and about because we do come across situations like this and everybody's got uh, their favorite technique for keeping the rodents away. Here's what I can tell you from my experience only from working on these things. Um, the RVs that are skirted, they have the skirting around them that goes from the bottom of the RV down to the ground. Um, when I have worked on RVs and I've had to go underneath those RVs where it's skirted, it's very scary. Um, there is a lot of evidence of rodents that have moved in underneath your RV. 
So while it makes sense to skirt your RV to keep the wind and everything from blowing onto there, the rodents have figured that out also, and they don't want to be in the wind and cold either. And so um, if you're skirting it, um, you might be inviting rodents to live underneath your RV. Okay. That's the first thing to be aware of. The second thing is if you're going to bait them and poison them, I would recommend baiting and poisoning them someplace away from your RV. Mm. Um, so here you've got your little mouse trap with the peanut butter, the cheese, and you put it right inside down underneath your RV. Well, if you think about that, you are inviting that rodent into your RV to eat the cheese and eat the peanut butter. So now you are saying, here's a nice trap, but here, little rodent, why don't you come in my RV to get it? So better would be to bait them someplace away from your RV. You, the goal is to eliminate the rodent. Um, so let's do that not inside your RV. Let's move the traps like away from the RV. Um, so, uh, so there's different baitings that you can do. Um, honestly, cats are fantastic if you can have cats. Um, just leave cabinets open and, and over a week they'll figure it out, you know. But if you don't like cats, if you're allergic to cats, if you can't have cats, um, uh, my experience with skirting is it, it might work, but um, we full time for 15 years and I've never skirted and I've been in a very cold 40 below temperatures and um, every, everything was okay. Um, so, so those are just some takeaways. If you're going to bait your rodents, do it not in your RV crawl spaces and basement areas because you are inviting them in. Uh, okay, so we have another question from Rob, um, and it's a furnace question. He okay. did not specify the model, um, but he says that his furnace or uh, a furnace he was working on, the blower wheel exploded into pieces. So his question is, I think, um, do you recommend replacing a metal wheel with a plastic? Um, plastic with metal, metal with plastic. Um, Okay, Darren's official answer is going to be you really need to um, get your model number and your serial number and contact the manufacturer. If it's a Dometic, if it's an Atwood, you can call Dometic. If it's a Dometic, you can call Dometic. If it's a Suburban, call Suburban. And provide them with this information. They're the ones that are going to give you the correct answer on that. I don't feel comfortable saying, well, yeah, if it, the plastic one shredded, go ahead and put a metal one on there. I'm not comfortable saying to do that. Why not? Um, the reason for that is, okay, so I was an engineer for a long time and we designed things to spec. And so if that wheel, let's, let's just do an exercise here. So I'm designing a furnace. Would it be a correct statement that the wheel, the blower wheel, the, there's a combustion wheel and then there's a, the, the blower wheel that sucks the air in and blows it back in the coach. If I've got a furnace that is like a 20,000 BTU furnace that you might find in a pop-up or one of these truck campers. Is that the exact same wheel for that 20,000 BTU furnace that you would find on a 40,000 BTU furnace, which you might have on a big fifth wheel or, or on a big class A? Yeah. You're moving cubic feet per minute, CFMs, over the heat exchanger, so therefore your motor is going to be a little different. You would not take the same exact motor and the same size wheel from a 20,000 BTU furnace and put it on a 40,000 BTU furnace. So the engineers that design these things... Um, they design the, the, the motor and the wheel to spec how many CFMs are going to go across that heat exchanger. Um, in their infinite wisdom, they had access to plastic, they had access to metal. And they chose that we're going to spec plastic for this application for this motor. And so if we just arbitrarily go put a metal wheel on because we know better than the people that are designing these things, then we might not have the right CFMs going across that heat exchanger. Um, the motor might not be rated to sling a big metal, you know, it, it might be a smaller motor with a plastic wheel versus a bigger motor with a metal wheel. The slats might be different angles, venturi angles, um, moving more air across. So um, in a situation like that, I would definitely have a conversation with the customer. They own that furnace. It's their furnace. It's not your furnace to make these calls. I would involve the customer in this decision. And... Um, and I would also involve the manufacturer. You can send them an email. Sometimes they have little text things. Just shoot a little text over it. And if, if they give it a good thumb up, mm -hmm. go for it. But um, I'm not comfortable. I, I like to, let, let me back up just a little bit. I've been on several service calls for a lot of appliances. And the reason that I'm there is because the previous technician put something on it that was out of spec. Could have been the wrong blower wheel. And now the CFMs aren't, maybe that's why the sales switch isn't making, for example. Or maybe the furnace is running, but we're not getting the same amount of air coming through my ducts. 
Um, I've been on refrigerator calls where the wrong heater element was put in, and that was the whole problem. You put the right heater element with the right wattage, and everything works. Um, so, yes, let's be smart, let's be official, let's be technicians, not just parts changers, and let's understand what that spec is, and let's try our best to fix a product with what is supposed to be. Okay, and I'll put you in the hot seat. Have you ever done this? Have you ever replaced a plastic motor with a metal, and under what circumstances, and how did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, after having a conversation with my customer, I stock plastic wheels. Um, there are times where you have, uh, we didn't rehearse this. No. <laughs> there, there are times where you're replacing a motor and the, the wheels are seized on the shaft. And uh, you can spend all this time and heat them up and get the emery cloth and put your PB blaster on there and that thing's still not coming off. So um, I stock... In fact, I have a metal wheel and a plastic wheel. They're, um, now, and here's the trick. Here, how, Darren, how do you know which wheel to stock? Um, if you get your, uh, let's just pick on, um, I'm gonna pick on the Atwood Hydrotherm, okay? Because it, it, everybody's got one, or I could have picked on Suburban. But there are exploded views of these furnaces, and you can get your exploded view, and then here's page after page after page of all the part numbers. And you go down there and you say, okay, blower wheel for this. I would stock the blower wheel that covers the largest bell curve of furnaces. Um, there's always an outlier at either extreme, but I'll just, if this one's going to take care of five furnaces, I'll stock it. Therefore, I've always got a plastic wheel with me, a combustion and a blower. Um, and so if I'm replacing a motor and the, the ones that I hate are the blower wheels that are metal. Those are the ones that seem to seize on the drive shaft the most, even though the fitting is supposed to be brass, even those seize. And it doesn't take much to work that thing and get it out of true because it's, you're pushing on it. I'm going into way too much detail. Um, and so I'll just put a plastic one on there. So I would put a plastic one on before I'd take a plastic and put a metal. Okay. But I, I have done it. Okay. And so, so you consulted with the customer. Yep. You made sure that... Um, the model numbers and everything were compatible, that one was compatible with the other? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. And a paint. Um, <laughs> it's cold. They want their furnace to work. Okay. So at the minimum, I've always communicated everything we do with the customer. Okay. That's one of the things I pride myself on. If you've been one of our customers and you're watching, I'm always having these dialogues with our customers to let them know, this is what I found. Um, this is my recommendation for repairing. It, I'm taking a plastic wheel off, I've got a metal, um, we're running a risk, but how, what do you feel about this? Okay. It's, it's after hours, we can't contact a medic, um, but maybe I could follow up in a couple of days after I send an email to them and see what they have to say. Okay. Those types of things. Okay. So. All right. Well, that's some good best practices. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions we have today. So I um, hope that you enjoyed these uh, furnace tips and the Q&A. Join us at our next live stream uh, the first Friday of every month at 4.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We do a live stream on YouTube. And if you liked this video, or even if you didn't, hey, give it a thumbs up. Or I guess a thumbs down. I, I, Never. I Never. hear that the algorithm works either way. Okay. okay. <laughs> but we prefer a thumbs up. And, I, I know um, that we get a lot out of your feedback. Yeah. And it helps us to know how to steer our ship of, of videos. Yeah. yeah. So like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Then you'll always be ready whenever we go live. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. And stay being a happy camper. Yeah, happy camper. Happy camper, say my RV works. <laughs> okay. See you on the next live stream. Bye. Bye.